Season three begins our actual first full season of Northern Exposure. Seasons one and two combined for 15 episodes. Season three, 23. Those bizarre and unique plot points, we're just looking at the base of the mountain here. We start off the third season with a send-off to our best worst boy, Rick, whose monument does look a little bit like a hood ornament. But his send-off isn't the worst. He even gets a eulogy from his girlfriend. Maggie's also there. You'd think following the season that was pretty much centered around what about Rick, that Maggie wouldn't have too much of an issue with Rick cheating. I mean, she has kissed multiple people other than her boyfriend since we've met her, but Maggie doesn't take it especially well. It does give us a fun little dream sequence where Maggie talks to Rick in heaven. This is not the last we see of Rick, but this is the first step to putting the lingering feelings surrounding their relationship to bed. They do turn Rick into a dog later on, but we'll get to that. It's in this season where the world of Northern Exposure really expands upon itself and sets to work in pushing forward its structure. In the X-Files, they have Monster of the Week episodes where Mulder and Skelly take on a unique monster and then move on when the credits roll. Northern Exposure, in comparison, has Character of the Week episodes in which a new character rolls into Sicily and our town folks take the episode to hang out with them or deal with them. A lot of these characters are just there for the episode, but some of these characters will ingrain themselves in the fabric of the show. In this season, we will get a lot of new characters, but we will also get some old friends returning to Sicily. Welcome back, Adam, and it's nice to meet you, Eve. We start off the season with Joel existing in his cabin, when a bump in the night disturbs his presence. The disturbance, Adam, whisks Joel away to tend to his wife who is suffering from an undisclosed ailment. It turns out that Eve, the hypochondriac of all hypochondriacs, is suffering from every single ailment that one can suffer, all at once and not at all. Eve is a force of nature every second she's on screen, which is saying a lot when she's playing counter to Adam, who's no slouch in that department either. Throw poor Joel into the mix and you've got a recipe for great TV. This all leads to Adam and Eve arguing Adam out of the house, and Eve kidnapping Joel to be her own personal doctor. There is a great scene when Adam comes back to see the imprisoned Joel being fed by his captor and freaks out. This sets up Joel to lead an impromptu marriage counseling session where both Adam and Eve are on full display in all of their glory. They do not take the good doctor's advice and splitting up, but they do let him free mostly. The world expands and Sicily grows anew with every episode. Chris has an identity crisis when his special stink that makes all the ladies crazy has no effect on a traveling optometrist. While Joel and Maggie crash land in the wilderness, Shelley's best friend rolls into town, engaged to her, Shelley's husband Wayne. In this season, we really get to see Ed's journey as a director, and with it, one of the show's first truly iconic moments. Ed's movie gets me emotional every time I see it. This is the personal side of TV storytelling that we've lost a bit of today. It's stripped down and raw in that indie film way that was just starting to poke its head out in those early 90s. It's such an old school love of film for both Ed and the people working on Northern Exposure. It's what inspired my love of movies and their creation in such a visceral way. I still tear up every time I watch it. It's also in this episode where Rick gets reincarnated as a dog. More and more of that absurd good magic of Northern Exposure keeps popping up. The Halloween episode is a great example of this. Joel's con man, probable criminal twin brother Jules comes to town, and the two Fleischmann's brothers decide to pull a fast one on everyone in town and switch lives for a week. This fools everyone in town, save for Ed and Maryland, and ends with Jules slash Joel on a date with Maggie, and Joel slash Jules in jail. Joel gets his therapy session with Sigmund Freud, and this all turns out to be one long concussion dream. And yeah, that's a bit of a trope now, but the vibes of this episode, the vibes are something else. It's so painstakingly Halloween. 
They play this swampy little jazz banjo number in the background that suits everything so well. That song is called Flight of the Cosmic Hippo, and the lighting in Cave Bear as Ed is talking to Chris about a bunch of miners being hacked up in a cave is just, mwah, cherry on the top. We get two out of our five-ish episodes surrounding a dead body, the first being a French soldier whose journal reveals that Napoleon might not have been at the Battle of Waterloo. The other surrounds Holling and Maurice's journey to bury their friend Bill way up north at a place called No Name Point. We get our first of two catapult episodes this season. This is what serves as events in Northern Exposure. Dead bodies and catapults. Unfortunately, Chris really wants to fling a cow with his catapult. For art. He just can't seem to find the right cow. Thankfully, someone clues him in that Monty Python already did this, and so he settles on Maggie's old piano instead. This is, of course, after her mom burns her house down, after already dropping the bomb on Maggie that she's divorcing her dad. Watching that piano fly through the air and crash into the earth is truly one of the most beautiful images ever captured on television. The circus comes to Sicily, and with its colorful cast of performers and astrophysicist ringleader comes one of the most truly northern exposure characters ever to exist, Enrico Bellotti, the Flying Man. Enrico, or if you're his friend, Bob, is full of that good northern exposure magic and serves as Marilyn's main love interest. You never see it, but Bob really does fly. He's one of three people canonically able to fly throughout the show's run. The scene where Joel sees Bob on the side of the road on his way into town, and then seeing Bob in town after his drive, is one of my all-time favorites. However, it's Sicily, the finale of season three, where the show enters into its true proto-prestige realms. Personally, it is not one of my favorite episodes, but I can see where the cast and crew were trying to go for something here, something more than the TV that surrounded them at the time. It all starts when Joel hits an old man with his truck. The old man is fine, as fine as you can be after being hit with the truck, and Joel takes him back to his cabin to give him some medical care. While the man rests, he tells Joel a story about how Sicily was founded. In this story, the residents of modern-day Sicily play the residents of pre-Sicily, each character playing an estimation of who they are in the 90s, and some characters evolving into those characters over the course of the episode. This episode, to me, doesn't crack the upper echelon of the best the show has to offer. And like I said, it's not one of my personal favorites, but I do think that it's important. It's important because of representation. Cicely and Rosalind are gay, but their gayness is never an issue. It's not even really brought up. It's simply who they are, and both the town and the show accepts them. Yes, they do fall into the tragic lesbian death trope, but they do get some points for trying. It's also important in the sense that this is where Northern Exposure takes the next step forward into the cinemization of TV. Does it feel a little bit like a TV movie at times? Sure. But when every episode of your television shows feels like another scene in one long movie, I think you're cooking with ingredients that no one else even realizes is edible. It starts becoming something truly different. With three seasons under the belt, I want to turn the focus towards a key element of Northern Exposure that pops up in every single episode, sometimes multiple times. Metaphysics. What is metaphysics? I don't know. You don't know. But holy moly do the town folks of Sicily love to get metaphysical about everything. A quick Google search explains that metaphysics is the school of philosophy that covers our relationship with reality, what it means to exist, and who we are in the grand sense. What does that mean for the show? 
our characters love to talk about everything. And I mean really talk about it. Get up all into whatever they're talking about. To an almost immersion breaking and then re-immersing level. Chris, our philosopher in chief, will spend whole episodes with his only purpose in the plot being him spouting off metaphysics over the airwaves. This gives a lot of episodes this extra theme, a lesson almost. Town hall meetings, for which there are many, will often break out into warring battles of philosophy and metaphysics, where a trucker will debate the ethics of sending an unknown body away against a 70 something shop clerk. There really are so many episodes that feature dead bodies. There is nothing like it. There are other shows that will follow one or two philosophies and will carry them as central themes throughout their run, but Northern Exposure will show you all of them. Psychology too. I know more about Jung and his collective unconscious and his pal Freud than I ever learned in school, and that's because they bring it up constantly. Northern Exposure is obsessed with the mind and how that mind makes each and every one of us unique and different, and in many ways, special. It wholeheartedly wants us all to expand and progress, because that's the only way we can come together and make it out of this mess. Whether you're a New York City doctor or a young native filmmaker, it might be the state's motto, but if I'm allowed to be a little metaphysical myself, I think it goes deeper than that north to the future. Whenever I would think back on Northern Exposure and my favorite episodes, I would think fondly about season four. My rewatch confirmed that belief 10 times over. It goes on this run of excellent episodes throughout the season, almost back to back to back, just quality episode after quality episode. So I think for this season, I'm going to highlight four episodes first, and then circle back around and talk about the rest of the season as a whole. The first one is, well, the first one of the season. We open on a luscious green field, peppered with colorful flowers painted in. Summer has come to Sicily. It's beautiful. Maggie and Chris are walking together on a path. It's Maggie's birthday, her 30th birthday, the big 3-0, and she's taking it great. No, really, she's taking it great. She has one appointment with Fleischman, and then it's off to her big birthday plans. Canoeing downriver, alone, and writing letters to all of her emotional baggage and casting them into the water. One big birthday reset. Buzz the kazoos and blow out the candles. I think there's something fantastic that happens every time Northern Exposure steps away from Sicily as its main setting. Seeing Alaska here, warm, summer Alaska, really gives us a different perspective than we're used to. I mean, Maggie camps out at night. No tent, nothing but the warm Alaskan air to keep her comfy. Sure, she wakes up with a high-grade fever so hot that it causes her to wander off into the woods and hallucinate. But there's something about summer in Alaska that seems so cozy. Those letters that Maggie was writing, that emotional baggage, well, let's just say certain things were said about certain dead ex-boyfriends that maybe those dead ex-boyfriends might take exception to if they were to read said river letters in some sort of previously mentioned fever-induced hallucination. Happy birthday, Maggie. That appointment that Maggie had with Joel earlier, it turns out her appendix is infected and about to explode, which it does during her river camping trip. Happy birthday, Maggie. Oh, the boys. Maggie's boys. Harry, Bruce, Glenn, Dave, Rick, and Steve? They went on a date once, and years later, Steve got struck by lightning on an oil rig. It's here, in this hallucination, that Maggie begins the first step of three to cast off that albatross around her neck, the O'Connell curse. The boys do put her through the ringer, leading her to accept her faults in their relationships. One thing I love about this scene is Maggie going, why am I doing this to myself? which is a level of awareness that you never see a character display when it's in some sort of hallucination or a dream. This emotional slugfest goes on long enough for the group to get a visitor. Joel Fleischman is a damn good doctor. Sure, he's a sweet little baby whose idea of camping is dozing off in the subway, but when action needs to be taken, Joel Fleischman takes that action. 
Seeing him hop into a canoe with no hesitation to save the day, which he does, getting Maggie the emergency surgery she needs, emphasizes that above all else, Joel Fleischman is a doctor at his core. This episode also features some cute Chris and Marilyn stuff, with the former trying to teach the latter how to drive to little success. And Maurice drives everyone in town crazy by openly recording his memoirs out loud. The next episode I want to highlight is the next episode. This theme of summer grows even stronger with an aspect that's unique to our setting, the never setting sun of Alaska. I think most people are aware of, through other pieces of media, 30 Days of Night, the immense darkness that Alaska will go through, but they actually experience the inverse as well. You see, for a solid two months out of every year, certain parts of Alaska essentially get no night. Even that short period between sunset and sunrise, often only two hours, is more of a dusk dawn than any true night sky. It's a jarring but not necessarily negative experience for our main man, Joel, whose exposure to this midnight sun fills him with more energy than six cups of coffee ever could. He has all of this energy, but he needs something to do. Something to devote all of this excess fuel towards. Well, good news, folks. It's basketball season, and Joey F. knows his round ball. Every year, the Sicily Quirks play their rival town, Sleep Mute, in an annual basketball game. This does bring up some minor timeline issues, something that can pop up from time to time during Northern Exposure. Like when it's mentioned that Bernard has come up for multiple of these games. That doesn't really feel like it matches up with how long Joel has been there, and when we met Bernard, it's not really a problem, but it's there. Joel combines the power of the sun and his inane ability to coach basketball to give the Quirks a sliver of hope. As the Quirks are routinely taken to the woodshed every time they play Sleep Mute. There is just something about Joel in this episode, the 100 miles per hour that he blazes through each scene that clings to my brain like flypaper. As Joel gets less and less sleep, his performance gets more and more insane. From the gum chewing to that damn whistle, he is a whirlwind, the Tasmanian devil, and oh boy, is our guy horny. I haven't really talked about just how horny the people of Sicily can be, but that knob, pardon my pun, can often get turned to 11 at a hair trigger. That good magic that floats around Sicily can make people do all sorts of things, from flying to having other people's dreams, but what it often does is get them all horned up. And poor Joel is about to burst in this episode. I hate to litigate Joel's sexual adventures, or more accurately, the lack of any, but it's season four, and the guy has been colder than Gnome in that department, batting a solid 0 for 100 since he's settled in the state. And Joel is not the only horny one in this episode, as Holling can't keep his eyes off of Shelly in her cheerleading outfit, and a traveling tailor is heart horny for Ruth Ann. Unfortunately, the Maggie-Joel relationship has hit the point where no one involved knows what's going on. Are they attempting to date? Who knows? Not them. Maggie's revved up Joel more times than you can count, and Joel's child pettiness can never let him admit anything close to feelings for another human being. So when Joel and his libido come knocking, Maggie slams the door. Now, Joel does walk through the window and listen, listen, I know how that sounds, but it's just the way he comes through that window that makes this manic performance so funny. It's all the little things that Joel does that elevates this episode into being something special. You combine it with the setting, Sicily, Alaska, a place that gives you so much to do with it, and the creative variety that comes from each episode just makes sense. Just as Maurice looks out at the 100,000 acres that makes up the area with an eye for its endless possibilities, so do the writers behind the curtain. I couldn't stop saying no other show has episodes like this over and over again while doing the research for this video. I'm pretty sure I've said that multiple times throughout this before, but it rings truer and truer as we get deeper into this. A whole episode surrounding an annual basketball game between two small towns set against the backdrop of a sun that never sleeps. No other show is doing an episode like this because there aren't any other shows like this. 
It's a show that trusts its characters to be strong enough to carry out such a concept, and trusts its audience enough to let that concept play out. No seasons-long, grand, overarching plots with twists and turns, cliffhangers that trap you into continually watching. It's unbridled creativity at its most free, possibly ever seen on TV. The Sun Mania does eventually cause Joel to crash hard. So hard that he sleeps through the big game, and through most of the week that follows. In the Quark's hour of need, Joel was doing the big snooze. But hey, they scored 24 points. Sure, Sleep Mute scored 89, but the Quarks doubled their points from last year. Double. Greg Popovich, eat your heart out. There's a new whistle blowing in town, and it came from Flushing, Queens, New York City, baby. This episode is so special because Joel makes it special. Even when he's at his worst, he's somehow always the best. And in this episode, he has the unfiltered power of the sun behind him. As I've said before, something really fun happens anytime Northern Exposure escapes from Sicily for an episode. Think of it almost as a reverse bottle episode. It's a well that the show goes back to every once in a while, and it almost always works out well for him. In this episode, Maggie, Joel, and us, the audience, take a trip to Motor City, Detroit. With the bribe of Nick's tickets, Joel agrees to come along as Maggie's plus one to her grandma's 80th birthday party. One slight issue. Grandma doesn't want a party, instead choosing to lock herself in the bathroom, only allowing Mary Margaret to come on in. This leaves poor Joel to fend for himself amongst a series of family drama ticking time bombs and a jealous ex-boyfriend of Maggie's. Jed. There are two halves to this episode. The warm comfort of a good familial bond locked away in its own special world. This is Maggie and her grandma in the bathroom. The other half? The existential dread of late stage capitalism. This is Joel and the rest of the house. From the very beginning, Joel is walking into one crisis which carries him through to the next. From Maggie needing a plus one, to Grandma not leaving the bathroom, to the priest's lack of confidence, Jed having a heart attack, Maggie's brother, Jeffy, being left by his wife, and most importantly, whether or not they're going to make the tip-off for this basketball game. It is crisis after crisis that Joel is stumbling through and into the middle of, and out through the back. This is Joel's suburban purgatory. Even out of Sicily, Alaska, and all the way to Detroit, Michigan, Joel Fleischman is still a fish out of water. His prison extends its walls. Gross Point is a funny name for such a rich place, and the people who inhabit it might just be the worst. Filled with Jeffy, Jeds, and Steffies. Steffi is innocent in all of this. Seeing Maggie's family, Bush pilot Miss Independent Mary Margaret, in their natural environment is a true testament to her fortitude and her neurosis. Anyone who's lived with her mom and Jeffy is going to come out of the experience a changed person. Even Grandma, as cool as she is here, must have been a workout to be related to. She's held this entire party hostage, a party that is all about her, somehow becomes even more about her. No character in Northern Exposure is without their flaws, and Maggie is no exception. A lot of the time, she is just as neurotic and petty as Joel is. She just tends to be right about things when Joel usually takes the losing side. It's impressive that she came out as well put together as she did. Joel recognizes this. As schoolyard crush, he pulls her hair, she kicks him in the shin, as Maggie and Joel's relationship is, there is this side of it. The sweet side. The tender. This is what's hiding underneath that rough exterior. Eventually, Maggie comes out from the safety of the bathroom, joining the exploded remains of all the various personal dramas that resembled a birthday party before, with a request. Her grandma wants to meet Joel. And with that, the night falls and the chaos settles. Maggie and Joel depart, and Joel actually gets to see his basketball game. Northern Exposure is a show about Sicily and the people who live in it. It's about Joel. It's about Maggie. It's about Maggie and Joel's relationship. And it's about Joel and Marilyn's relationship. You see, out of nearly all the people that Joel has in his life, few are as close to him in Sicily than his assistant of very few words. 
She is his silent North Star. You see, it all starts when Marilyn gets a check from her tribe. A check to the tune of $5,000. This is not a rare occurrence for Marilyn. She gets a check like this almost twice a year from the tribe. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Marilyn is going to take the money and go on an adventure. She wants to go to the city. Not Anchorage, not Nome, Seattle. A lower 48 city. A real one. This does not sit well with Joel. Not from any place of jealousy or disdain, but one from an almost maternal instinct. Big Mama Joel cannot let his baby bird leave the nest without worrying just a little bit. Like everything when it comes to Joel, it festers. Marilyn isn't cut out for the city. She wasn't molded by it like Joel was. It'll eat her up and spit her out. He gives her some city-proof gizmos and some stern advice, allowing her with timid permission to leave his nest for about all of 24 hours. Marilyn wants an adventure. She doesn't want Joel's driver. She doesn't want Joel's concierge at Joel's hotel. She wants an adventure. And she does in her own special Marilyn way. This does mostly involve her silently sitting, but it's big city sitting. However, her adventure puts her well off the path that Mama Joel set out for her, leading to that festering to only increase. As the hours pass with no sign of Maryland, Joel decides to take things into his own hands, well past the point that someone as self-absorbed as he is ever would. He extends his prison sentence. Joel needs money to get to Seattle. $400, a full month's pay. The only man in town that could cover such a bill is Maurice. And like a good loan shark, Maurice is happy to oblige. He even doubles the amount that Joel is asking for. Because it's not the money he's looking for. It's the time. Two months extra at the end of his sentence. This is the thing that Joel holds most precious. Leaving Sicily as quickly as he possibly can. And he's willing to give that up for Marilyn. This is not some small sacrifice for Joel who any sacrifice becomes a big one, and yet for Marilyn, he does it. Now, it must be said, he does this mostly out of his own neurosis, as Marilyn is truly off on her own world, having the adventures she wanted with absolutely no danger popping up along her path. This doesn't stop Joel from unsuccessfully trying to get the Seattle PD to put out an APB for her, leading for him to go on a citywide hunt for his lost receptionist. And Joel does find her, because he knows her. He steps out of his own narcissistic world and reaches out towards someone else, who was in zero need of reaching out and was perfectly fine. So it's a half step. Joel's emotional connection might reach higher peaks with other characters, but his relationship with Marilyn is his most genuine. So there we are. Four special episodes that really define the season. There are so many good episodes in Season 4, truly a time when it was in its prime. But these four episodes give us the broad strokes to see it at a distance. So do we have anything else to say about it? Any other housekeeping? Something important we are leaving out? How about a brand new main character who gives us the first thing we have to a season-long storyline? Mike Monroe, the Bubble Man, is a lawyer who moves his hermetically sealed biodome to Sicily's outskirts, after developing a severe allergy to the modern world. If he even sniffs a synthetic fiber, he's going to break out in hives. Mike serves as the manifestation of that good northern exposure magic, as his affliction is almost superpowered and yet contradictory in nature. Mike can detect pollutants from miles and miles away, but also has the ability to walk through Sicily free from an allergic reaction. I don't think it's supposed to make sense. I remember Mike being in more of this season, but in the season's 25 episodes, he's only in 10 of them. But it's his impact, the changes he forces in both Maggie and Joel, that cause him to leave a lasting taste in the show's mouth. And he does change Maggie and Joel by forcing them closer, by pushing them apart. Mike is everything Joel is not, attentive, giving, mindful of others' thoughts and feelings, the anti-Joel, Maggie's perfect man. But there's a catch to any relationship between Maggie and Mike, more than Mike's affliction. 
the O'Connell curse. Maggie can't bring herself to put the only good man in her life in harm's way. Joel, she'll take that risk. Mike, not so much. This begins the push-pull tug-of-war between Maggie and Joel, with Mike as the rope. In what starts off as a fascination for Maggie, the man in the bubble becomes her first positive romantic relationship she's ever had in her life. Yes, she does sleep with Joel in the middle of it, but that was like the evil wind's fault. She also immediately blacks out the event from her mind, leaving poor Joel in a state of mental spaghetti. But the point still stands. Maggie can love without the fear of her curse getting in the way. Not only does Mike not die, but he's cured of his disorder. He's able to leave the bubble, and in turn, he leaves Maggie. There are noble intentions behind his actions. He has a new lease on life, a second chance to do right in the world. So he goes off to fight the good fight alongside Greenpeace. This affects Maggie, hurts her, obviously, but she comes out of it better. Less neurotic, less angry at the world. She can love, free of fear. She just can't love Mike. But she can love another. It's just going to require some time and effort on that person's part. The O'Connell curse is broken. Burn those black fedoras. We don't need them anymore. Technically, they were already burned. 